folks in. So it's kind of crazy how everyone will like start popping up. Slowly but surely. So welcome everyone who's joining us. We're just gonna wait a few seconds for everyone to start coming in and then we'll get started. One last chance to fix my hair. <laughs> exactly. Actually, I screwed it up, that's better. <laughs> Hello everyone. So I'm going to start my introductions because um, it doesn't really matter much if people <laughs> miss that part so that you can have as much time as possible, Sam. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, we are going to get started. Thank you all for tuning into our program this morning on transitioning your lawn to a meadow. We are so excited to have Sam Quinn from SUNY ESF Restoration Science Center partnering with us to present this talk. My name is Camille Marcotte and I'm the water and ecology educator with Cornell Cooperative Extension Onondaga County. I just want to go over a few quick things and then I'll introduce Sam and let him take it away. Um, we are using Zoom in webinar mode, so you all are muted right now, just so that there's no background noise because we do have quite a few folks on. Um, if at the end you'd like to ask a question using the microphone or audio, you can always click on the little raise hand button at the bottom of the screen and I can unmute you. Um, we're going to wait until the end to answer any questions, but feel free to type questions throughout the webinar into the either the Q&A or chat section. And if you use the Q&A function, you can also ask questions anonymously if you'd like to do that. Um, I'm going to be monitoring those for when we get to the end. Um, this program will be recorded, so we'll be posting that to both the Skinny Atlas website as well as our Cornell Cooperative Extension website, and I'll send all of the websites and resources and an evaluation in a follow-up email at the end of the webinar. Um, so I wanna quickly introduce um, CCE Onondaga and the Skinny Atlas Lake Education Program. So Cornell Cooperative Extension Onondaga County is part of the nationwide extension system run through Cornell University in New York State. Um, in New York State, Extension has a presence in every county and we share research-based information to help local communities. We have many different program areas um, and topics that we cover. In our office, we have 4-H and agriculture, nutrition, horticulture, and natural resources. Uh, our Skinny Atlas Lake Education Program is funded by the City of Syracuse to provide education to help protect the water quality of Skinny Atlas Lake. And we do this through offering programs like this and re sharing resources and updates um, through our newsletters and social media. So you can always sign up for that. Um, and if you haven't checked out the website for Skinny Atlas Lake, we post all of the program recordings to that and update that regularly. And you can visit that at scanlakeinfo.org and I'll put that link into the chat as well. Um, so otherwise I'll introduce Sam. Uh, Sam Quinn is a researcher and instructor at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. He's a member of SUNY ESF's Restoration Science Center, where he focuses on the center's conservation on private lands initiative. Sam's research and teaching center on the role of private landowners and efforts to enhance habitat to preserve and promote biodiversity. So thank you, Sam, and you can take it away. Wow. Thank you, Camille. Um, it was a wonderful introduction. Uh, it saves me a lot of time because I didn't know how to introduce myself. And thank you all for attending this seminar uh, or webinar on Lawn to Meadow. Welcome to my home, by the way, almost back in the office. So apologies if the mailman comes and one of my dogs starts barking, but that's part of the, the fun of the world we live in. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen so we can begin our presentation and um, really what I want to focus on today are some big picture ideas. Um, as you'll, you'll see in our presentation, uh, this whole lawn to meadow concept is really site specific and there's no one size fits all approach. So we're going to talk about broad stroke things and um, I encourage all of you to reach out to me and the others at the Restoration Science Center with more questions. Um, and, and this is a, a prep for that. At the very end, we'll have a slide with lots of information on how to contact us, including links to social media, our websites, um, uh, QR codes so you can scan with your cell phone. 
for um, more information about the Restoration Science Center and also this Meadow program in particular, including uh, signing up for uh, an in the field workshop to learn about Meadows. So but before I begin about Meadows, I do want to tell you just a little bit about the Restoration Science Center. Um, I actually went to ESF as a student. And then I was a land manager at a property in Northern Virginia for many years. Uh, and you'll see a lot of pictures from there. And then I returned to ESF in 2017 and I work on our Conservation on Private Lands Initiative, which is within the Restoration Science Center. And although we're talking about Lawn to Meadow today, that's just one small piece of what the Restoration Science Center does. We have many projects locally and globally focused on uh, four main areas, ecosystem restoration, and, which is similar to what we're talking about today, restoring these meadow native plant communities, uh, species specific restoration, which involves anything from Dr. James Gibbs's work with giant tortoises in Galapagos to Dr. Bill Powell's work with restoring the American chestnut and also biocultural restoration. These ways to connect people back to the land and, and foster a more harmonious relationship with the land and, and the cultures that manage this landscape long ago. And, and finally, agroecological restoration, using plants and agricultural uh, species to regenerate the land, even in urban areas, and to provide a more equitable access to food to people. So we do so much. Lawn to Meadow is a, a program that grew organically from landowner interest. We really have landowners in Skinny Atlas to thank for the reason this program exists. People reached out to ESF and eventually found their way to me. Um, and, and we were able to leverage my many years of experience as a land manager, particularly in creating and maintaining these meadow plant communities to hey, create this program. Yes? What I did I do wrong? Are you, are you sharing your slides or Probably not. not. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, you haven't missed anything yet. Oh, fantastic start, right? And we, believe it or not, we all practiced this a minute ago, Camille and I. Hey, so anyway the Restoration Science Center. And I'm gonna minimize my face here because I'm very distracting. All right, so you haven't missed anything, folks. Um, I would like to do something a little different. Normally people put their thank you slide at the very end of a presentation, but I would like to start with it because we have some very important partners. First and foremost, the Lawn to Meadow program and demonstration sites that we are doing this summer, were, all this work was made possible by a grant from the Central New York Community Foundation. That grant has allowed us to buy the materials to create meadow demonstration sites in Skinny Atlas and to hire two grad students to manage all of this work and create a lot of the materials, informational materials that we will be able to provide to the public like you all uh, at the end of this summer. And I of course have to thank other partners, Go Native Perennials and Skinny Atlas who is hosting our, restor our meadow restoration sites. So thank you, Mary and Janice, for putting so much time into this and offering your property up. Um, Ernst Conservation Seed, who donated the seed for this project. Uh, there are many seed suppliers that I work with, uh, Roundstone Seed, Prairie Moon, Prairie Nursery, Pinelands, but I've worked the most with Ernst Conservation Seed. And when I told them about this project, they were happy to donate seed. Um, and so we'll see that later today. Also, of course, the Skinny Atlas Lake Association, who is so helpful in protecting the lake and connecting us to landowners, and our good friends, the Central New York Land Trust, who we also do a lot of work with in restoring meadows and other plant communities at their trust properties. And these are just a few of the growing list of partners just for this one program of the Restoration Science Center. All right, let's get on to the meadows. So very briefly, I just want to give an overview of what we'll talk about. And of course, we only have an hour, so I can only briefly touch on many of these subjects. And I'm trying to focus on the elements that I think you all will be most interested in. And I assume many of you are landowners in Skinny Atlas or nearby who are considering, hey, is this right for me? Could I have a meadow on my property? And what I'd like to do is talk first about why lawns are bad. And then why meadows can be a wonderful alternative? Why are they beneficial ecologically? And most importantly, with regard to our work in Skinny Atlas, how can they benefit water quality by protecting and enhancing water quality through land management? We'll also discuss the basic steps of meadow establishment and maintenance, which will be a tour of our demonstration sites that we've just started in Skinny Atlas. And finally, cost 
is such an important factor that is talked about too little. So I want to run through some basics of thinking about the financial side of this type of land management. But let's begin with, I'm not being hyperbolic, one of the greatest threats to biodiversity, the lawn. Uh, look, we all like lawns, uh, or, you know, people like lawns. <laughs> and they're a very American uh, type of, of land management that, that we are somehow obsessed with. And I'm, I'm not sure why. It seems to be a challenge to maintain the most sterile, uniform piece of grass possible. And if you look at lawns from my perspective as a conservation biologist, uh, so my goal is to understand and protect the diversity of living things. Well, lawns are very problematic. Uh, these perfect turf landscapes are they're dominated usually by exotic species, so grasses uh, and flowers like white clover that are not native to this part of the world. And to maintain them looking nice and pretty and uniform, these lawns require enormous inputs of water or in some cases amendments like fertilizer or herbicides. And then to cut them requires weekly or bi-weekly uh, mowing and weed eating and the two and four stroke engines that these machines used to operate put enormous amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And of course, there's many situations where even a well-intentioned landowner uh, by maintaining a lawn without using fertilizers or pesticides or mowing as infrequently as possible, well, these lawns still represent massive habitat loss. Now, if you see in this picture here, it's a uniform green flatness. Now, if you're a wild animal, there's little space for you to live. There is no three-dimensional complexity. Both above ground and below, the soil community be beneath a lawn is very low diversity compared to the, the creatures, micro and macro, that you would find living under these meadow communities. In a sense, a lawn is a biological desert. Let's look at this in another way. How much lawn is there? So let's take uh, the United States and let's start kind of small. We'll, we'll do the lower 48, the contiguous United States. In this extent, there's just under 3 million square miles. So let's compare lawns to something we're more familiar with. How about national parks? Within this area, there's just over 42,000 square miles of national parks, or just about 1.5% of the total land area. Now, in 2015, NASA added up the lawn area in the same extent, and well, they found that there's about 63,000 square miles of lawn. And even if that estimate is at the high end of the standard of error, that's still as much or even slightly more lawn than all of the national parks in the lower 48 put together. Now, I'm pointing this out to help you all recognize the tremendous good you as private landowners can do to restore a disappearing ecosystem and promote all of the biodiversity that depends on this ecosystem. Now, most importantly, for those of you living around Skinny Atlas Lake, meadows also represent a way to enhance water quality compared to lawns. And that is very important for the 200,000 some people that drink Skinny Atlas, Skinny Atlas Lake water. Now, I'm not saying you have to eliminate all of your lawn. We need places to picnic and walk. Our dogs need places to play. So think strategically. This isn't an all or nothing. Every little bit of good you do to restore native plant communities will help lake health, will help beneficial insects and the animals that eat them. And meadows are also dog friendly. Uh, there's no reason a dog can't play in a meadow. And I've helped people make meadow mixes that are specifically designed to make sure that they're good for dogs, you know, no poisonous plants or things like that. So again, don't think of this as a black and white meadow or lawn approach. You can strategically use pieces of your property in ways that work for you. All right, well, okay, what is a meadow? I've said the word about a thousand times already, I should explain. Uh, very basically, a meadow, or I also call them grasslands, is a very broad ecological term for a plant community composed of flowers and grasses with few to no woody plants. And after I say that, I usually get the question, well, why can't I just stop mowing my lawn? Fair question. Well, here's an example. This is a, a pasture in Pennsylvania that hasn't been mowed. And you can see it's dominated by tall fescue, which is a non-native grass that has gone to seed and uh, some non-native flowers that have shown up. And don't get me wrong, uh, beauty is subjective, but 
I do find these rolling green pastures of the United States to be beautiful, even though they are completely unnatural. And yet, even though this meadow could support something like um, nesting grassland birds of certain species and at certain scales, the plant diversity is so low that you don't get all the other benefits. You don't get the associations with caterpillars that allow butterflies to lay their eggs on a milkweed, for example, and caterpillars eat the plants and then songbirds eat the caterpillar, feed it to their young, etc. And importantly, the below ground biomass of these meadows is tremendous. Compared to a pasture like this where the grasses root only a few inches into the soil, some of these meadow species, as we'll see later in the talk, root many feet deep, building soil organic matter, sequestering carbon, filtering water, and holding the soil, and creating a thriving community of soil organisms. Okay, so let's forget about just not mowing your lawn. Another important aspect of meadows is that they support very high diversity, a high diversity of plants that in turn supports a high diversity of wildlife. And for our purposes, generate valuable ecosystem services like enhancing water quality. <clears throat> now, a key decision maker for a lot of people considering this for their own property is that in many cases, meadows can be far less expensive to maintain than a traditional lawn and a very, very beautiful landscape feature. Now, I have this video from a meadow I made in Virginia. I think it's going to be very choppy when you watch it, so I apologize. I'll play it anyway, and I'll point some things out, and hopefully you can see some of it. But what I want to illustrate is the abundance of insect life in this meadow. Uh, you see a eastern swallowtail butterfly in the foreground momentarily when I press play you're going to see uh, some very, very cool insects. For example, a hummingbird moth will appear in a moment. And I hope you can see at least some of this because it is swarming with solitary bees and lepidopterans. And here comes our friends, the Northern Clearwing, also called a hummingbird moth. That insect is an insect. It looks like a hummingbird. And it's drinking nectar from those tubular flowers of the bee balm. We see echinacea in the background. And when is the last time you saw this, this plethora of insect life over your lawn? Just a, a demonstration of the diversity of plants and insects that we can support with these ecosystems. And ecosystems they are. Grasslands naturally in the United States are in decline. Over half of the grasslands that used to cover the, the um, uh, American portion of North America are gone, replaced by agriculture and development. And as these species, dis as these plant communities disappear, so too do the species that depend on them. A monarch is a well-known example. Monarch caterpillars eat only milkweed species plants, and the adults drink nectar from a diversity of flowers, in this case, uh, another common milkweed there. And they need these abundant floral resources throughout the country on their long migrations north or south. Without them, they don't have enough food and we're seeing massive declines in these migratory insects. Another perhaps lesser known example, this is a plant with the coolest name of any plant. It's called Rattlesnake Master. It used to be an abundant portion of meadows and prairies in the American Midwest. And of course, as this plant disappears with the disappearing grasslands, so too do species that depend on it, like the rattlesnake master borer moth. That little moth was up for listing as a federally endangered species, though recently it was turned down because there was a lack of information. So we see the intimate connections between plants and the wildlife they support throughout the food chain. And you all, as private landowners, you can't necessarily restore a mature forest on two acres, but you can restore portions of these native meadow plant communities. For those of you who don't care about butterflies and bees, well, perhaps you care about birds. Birds in this part of the world have a diverse diet and songbirds, no matter what they eat as adults, almost every single one, something about 96% of the species in the Eastern US still feed caterpillars to their chicks. And there is a direct relationship between the diversity of plants in a meadow or, or other plant community and the abundance of caterpillars. So remember caterpillars like monarchs may be only able to eat certain types of plants. So the more plants you have in an area, the more caterpillars you can have and the more food for baby birds. The complex 
three-dimensional structure, like literally the physical shape of these meadows, allows for wildlife to use them as cover. Now, this is a meadow in Northern Virginia after an ice storm and notice the very robust plants create pockets in the ice. They would do the same in heavy snows. That is shelter for little songbirds. It's shelter for small mammals like voles. And if this were a lawn, there would be no escape. It would be, well, there would be no animals left. And locally, you can find uh, examples of making little friends. This is a toad that lives in the meadow in my backyard. Uh, we see them all the time. And these experiences are really important for people to get to know nature in their own backyard, especially for kids. Uh, instead of going to some reserve, which is great, you can foster relationships with these animals with your own property in your own backyard and in very, very small spaces, which is not possible with other plant communities. In this day and age, we have to also plan for resilience against a changing climate. Um, and we experience issues related to climatological changes all the time. Uh, you know, we have had a very, very wet last few weeks, uh, tremendously wet. And that's great in some situations, but we also go through periods of drought. And these meadow plants are adapted to extreme weather conditions, unlike our exotic turf season or turf cool season grasses and flowers. So here's one meadow in Northern Virginia in a very wet time of year. This next photo, almost the exact same position in the same meadow in an extreme drought. I mean, 55% less rain than the average in this particular year and the meadow is still thriving. No water necessary, uh, no inputs at all necessary and it is full of flowers, full of life. The reason for this is that meadow adapted plant species are deeply rooted. Uh, here's a, a commonly used diagram. Many of you have probably seen it showing the above and below ground biomass of meadow plants. And the text is very small. I had to, to fit it all in. But notice many of these plants root down deeply as deep as 15 feet into the soil if the soil allows it. And that not only allows plants to access water that's deeper in the ground when necessary, but again, remember the storage of carbon. These meadows are essentially upside down forests with regard to biomass and the carbon they sequester. And the thriving soil uh, biota, the filtration and building of soil with regard to soil organic matter. Now, I, I wanna point something out too. Look on the left, I just circled it, or I squared it in red. That's Kentucky bluegrass. <laughs> and it roots down maybe a couple inches. So when we think about land protecting a water body like Skinny Atlas Lake from infiltration, from perhaps a contaminant flowing over the surface, compare Kentucky bluegrass with its short above ground and short below ground biomass to all of these bushy native plants that can trap erosion above ground and hold the soil below ground. Another quick example to illustrate that, uh, here's several different meadows at uh, the property I managed in Virginia, illustrating that beyond providing wildlife habitat, these plant communities have wonderful services with regard to water quality. On the center of the screen, you can see a pond. That's an irrigation pond used to water the crops over here. And the water that feeds this pond flows through Shenandoah National Park through these meadows with um, very tall species, species like big blue stem Indian grass that grow seven or eight feet tall in that part of the world and root down over 10 feet. And that water is filtered by the roots of these plants. And I know that the quality has increased because I tested these water bodies for years as these meadows grew and we watched it improve in terms of clarity and quality and factors like uh, nutrient inputs and even diminishing disease like um, fecal coliform counts, E. coli, and other issues that can, be in, that can be exacerbated by overland flow of soil and material, trapped by all of these meadow plants. So um, a very quick uh, slideshow of, of meadows, but I want to talk a little bit about in terms of a landowner and your objectives. Now, you want meadows to look pretty, not just be a functional piece of habitat that you're not allowed to touch. 
But it's very important to understand that these are not static landscape installations. A meadow is a plant community and it is a dynamic system that evolves from year to year where you'll see shifts in plant composition. In a drier year, the grasses may dominate. In a wet year, the flowers or certain flowers, you will see plants begin to sort, some of them moving to perhaps lower portions of wherever you put the meadow where it's wetter and you'll get a dominating species there. Uh, and even throughout a season, these meadows, much like tree foliage, change color, they change texture. And as much as in one day with weather events, a meadow can change dramatically in appearance. Now, it's important for you to understand too, um, we like to help landowners determine if these, these habitats are right for them. And you have a lot of control over how tall a meadow is, its colors, and other aesthetic elements. I'll show you more examples of that soon. And now we'll talk more about that at the ends with questions. Just a few more examples of how these meadows change through the season. Um, I'm gonna show you pictures of meadows I've either created or helped manage, uh, just so you get a sense of how dramatically different they look. Uh, here's an example in Northeastern Pennsylvania in June. At this time of year, dominated by the white flowers are Penstemon digitalis, and the purple flowers that you can see down here, those are uh, spiderworts, I think Ohio spiderwort. And, it's a really, really cool color scheme at this time of year, the white and purple, but just a month later in July, all the colors of the rainbow. Now we have the yellow, that's oxeye sunflower. The red swaths are seed heads of an autumn bent grass. We have white, uh, well, just clusters of mountain mint that looks like Pycnanthema muticum. And then we zoom in and see the abundance of insect life. Uh, this is Culver's root, the white flowers covered in bumblebees. Now in September and fall, we have yellows from goldenrods dominating, purples from asters, and the bronze gold color of all the grasses and their autumn foliage. This is all the same meadow. Uh, notice how it changes. It's so dynamic. I, I have a meadow in my backyard. You'll see pictures of it. My favorite thing to do is just sit and look at it every day. And, and you learn so much about how these plant communities interact. And to me, looking at this meadow is like a reflection of the fall foliage and the trees. And it's so much more interesting than a flat green sterile space. Some more examples now back in Virginia, here's a meadow in July and almost the exact same position now in, in November. Now, I think these plant communities are perhaps the most beautiful in winter. Uh, again, it's just my taste, but the tans, the bronzes, the golds of the grasses and dried flowers provide character and structure all year. Um, you don't have to mow these meadows in winter like some people think you do. Um, that's an aesthetic choice, and I, I wouldn't recommend you do that. As little work as possible because then you retain all of this cover for wildlife. Another meadow on the same property, this one designed to be very short, only about two and a half, three feet tall, and for the purpose of allowing people on the road on the left to see the horses that live in the field on the right. Um, and here we see different plants dominating. We see in the foreground, this is Monarda punctata, a beautiful pyramidal flower. We'll see more pictures of that close up later. And we see lots of grasses, little blue stems, uh, broom sedge, and this cloudy uh, material here. That's an example of the ephemeral weather effect I was discussing at the beginning. Those are the seed heads of big top lovegrass, Aragrostis hirsutus. And in particular weather conditions, a, a dewy morning, a light rain, the seed heads catch the moisture. And when they do, when the light hits them, they sparkle and they create these very ephemeral looks that they only exist for a short time occasionally. And it's very special. So again, dynamic systems. Just a few more pictures because I love these, these habitats and, and features when they're dry and late summer, fall. All right, so a, a quick overview. Now let's get into what it takes to create a meadow. And we'll, we'll do this by describing what we've done at our demonstration site in Skinny Atlas at Go Natives. So when you design any habitat, you have to determine what your objectives are. And as a conservation biologist, my goal is to enhance biodiversity. So how can I support living things? Of course, I have other purposes. In the case of our work in Skinny Atlas, we also want to enhance water quality. And for most landowners, of course, we want these, these plant communities to be beautiful. 
So here's a way to think about it. There is a bee balm with very appropriately a bumblebee on it. And that bee balm has a long tubular flower and the bumblebee has a long tongue, dips its tongue down into the tube to get at the nectar. When the bee balm finishes flowering, another species in the same mix, Monarda punctata, with a similar tubular flower will begin flowering. So it's like a leapfrog effect of one after another, there's always a flower type available for these long tongued bees and butterflies. They complement each other. Another example here's Lanceleaf coreopsis, again, uh, same meadow. And we have a solitary bee on this ray type flower with a very short tongue. So there is, imagine in a meadow as a menu, there is an item on the menu for everyone every single beneficial insect and, and other wildlife have something to eat as long as possible. And the way you achieve this is through diversity. Diversity is key, it provides resilience. If one plant disappears from either disease or perhaps a drought, another will take over. And then in different conditions that other plant will return. So diversity is key and it helps provide not just resilience and food for wildlife, but it makes sure that these habitats self-sustain. So let's quickly talk about what it takes to establish a meadow. And I am going to absolutely just zoom through this because it's a very nuanced process. It's not the same as gardening or, or establishing a turf lawn, though there's many similarities. We'll give examples of each one, but again, all of these choices are so site specific and depend on a, on a landowner's objective that there's no one size fits all approach to this process. And by the way, anyone who tells you there is, is ripping you off. The most important step is clearing the existing vegetation. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot establish a meadow where there is existing vegetation. It does not work. You could try to plant meadow species as plugs, you know, containerized plants, and sure, they may persist, but they don't form the structure that makes a meadow so important. They will be, they will be outcompeted by the existing grasses and flowers. Then, of course, you have to seed the meadow by sowing the meadow seed. And finally, maintain it in the critical first year or two when the meadow is young. Uh, these species of plant are not like turf grasses that grow very quickly. They take a very long time to mature and they live a very long time. You have, to, you have to take extra care with them the first year or two. Still far less care than you would need for a lawn at any time, but still it's important. And by the way, I should mention that these meadows are uh, self-sustaining ecosystems. You don't have to keep reseeding them. They are dominated by perennial species that will persist through time. Clearing vegetation is not only the most important step in establishing a meadow, but it is also potentially the most complicated. And that's because while there are many, many methods to clear vegetation, choosing a method is a balancing act of the efficacy and the potential environmental harm that technique can cause. Of course, cost is also an important factor and cost among these methods can vary strongly. Here are some of the most common methods um, you know, these involve soil disturbance like tilling, which must be done many times. It can't just be done once and you walk away. Scouring the top layer of soil away in the center image and the use of herbicides. These are very common methods. Um, I wanna be absolutely clear. I hope my bold text and all those asterisks uh, make the point. These techniques, no matter what they are, should be done by experienced professionals. We do not want any of you to begin uh, disking soil right next to Skinny Atlas Lake or spraying herbicides without consultation with professionals. And in most cases, this is not work that your average landowner can do themselves. It requires experience and licensing. So please don't go out and start spraying herbicides because you saw in this presentation. <laughs> Now, for our demonstration sites at Go Natives, we use two techniques for two separate meadows. And first, we use scouring to clear the site. And this involves literally stripping off the top few layers, uh, top few inches of the soil layer. And we did that by using this um, bobcat machine with a little fork on it. And you can see that it strips off these portions of soil that are held together by the roots of the vegetation. And after doing one strip, this is what it looks like. Now this is ideal because 
the, not only is the existing vegetation gone, but removing a top layer of soil also removes the seed bank of weed seeds that are in the soil. Now, this is very important. Let's say you were to do something like uh, apply an herbicide to clear vegetation. Well, sure, but depending on what's in the seed bank, once that existing vegetation has been cleared, it will allow these seeds in the seed bank to germinate, and then you may get a, a different problem. So exhausting that seed bank is key. And by scouring the soil, you can remove all of those seeds with the advantage of being able to establish your meadow right after it's completed. Now, I'm sure some of you are looking at this and saying, oh my God, that'll never work on my property. I'm on a slope right next to Skinny Atlas Lake. And you're right. These methods are not appropriate in every situation. You have to read the site and understand what is the best, and, and by best I mean in terms of ecological health, what is the best choice for your site conditions. This is a very flat area. I would not propose this level of soil disturbance on a slope or especially near a sensitive feature like Skinny Atlas Lake or one of its tributaries. Now at the other site at Go Natives, we took advantage of a smothered section of crop field that Mary and Janice had prepared for a couple of years, um, not thinking that they were gonna put a meadow there, but they happened to have this tarp preventing weeds from growing and weed seeds from accumulating in the soil because they were blocked by the, the tarp. Uh, you can see that there's some holes in it and that's allowed weeds to pop up and that's okay. So here's an example of smothering the site where the vegetation can't grow because there's no light and the weed seeds can't accumulate. So we simply removed this tarp and we were good to go. So those are just two examples of soil clear, of vegetation clearing techniques. Many more, there's you know, herbicides of course, and there's many types of herbicides. Um, you know, I, although I have used many herbicides and I consider myself an expert in them, I don't like them. Uh, but there are a lot of misconceptions about them. And, and even though they're a critical tool in my land management toolkit as a professional conservation biologist, I don't think they should be sold in stores without licenses. It's, it's crazy to me someone could walk into a Home Depot and buy glyphosate. You should have to have training and licensing for that. Anyway, that's my brief soapbox about herbicides. I just want you all to know how serious and um, potentially dangerous any of these techniques can be if done improperly. So again, professional help is required. All right, we've cleared our site. What's next? We got to sow our seed. Well, first, it's important to make sure the seed bed is adequate. Now, here we have an example of um, just giving it a light rake to create small furrows, shallow furrows to help catch the seed. Unlike agricultural crops that you need to, like a, a grain crop that you need to bury an inch or two deep in the soil, these warm season grass and flower seeds we use to establish meadows really only want to be buried in you know, a quarter inch, half inch at most in the soil, maybe even right at the surface. So a very light rake just breaks up the top soil layer and creates shallow furrows that the seeds can drop into and then be buried over. On larger sites, the ideal way to seed a meadow is using a specially designed seed drill. Um, these are not the same seed drills that are used in agriculture. They are specially designed for these diverse seed mixes. Uh, if you try to use a grain drill that you have for your farm to establish a meadow, it's not going to work. Um, this is a Truax model who makes these implements specifically for meadows. However, for most of you, you're using very small plots of land. Um, you don't need to go overboard on something like this. And in fact, it probably prohibitive, it would be prohibitively expensive for many of your properties. Most of you would probably be fine with broadcast seed. Uh, this is just a, a crank seeder, but you can really just throw out seed by hand. Uh, I have seeded meadows by hand that were uh, six or seven acres. It takes a while, but you can totally do it. And notice once the seeds are strewn about on the soil, you can see the furrows that we raked in. And there are dozens upon dozens of seeds that are lying on the soil now. What? What is critically important after the seeds are sown is to achieve good soil to seed contact. Notice that some of these seeds are just kind of sitting on the soil. It's gonna take a long time for them to work into the soil and be able to germinate. So we roll the site. Uh, this is just a handheld held roller of mine that I fill with water, very easy to use. And notice it's pressing the soil down, collapsing those furrows and burying the seeds under it. For larger sites, there are larger rollers. Um, you can attach to an ATV or a tractor. 
And uh, this just helps achieve that soil to seed contact, bury the seeds very slightly, and then we add some mulch. Uh, the mulch is critical, especially if you're on a sloped site or a sensitive site. We use a very light layer of straw in most cases. And this not only protects the soil from erosion, but it helps hide the seeds from seed predators like mice and birds. Um, we expect to lose some seeds to those uh, animals, but this helps protect the seeds in terms of moisture and, and hide them a little bit. On very steep areas, you might want to use an erosion mat just to be safe. And I would say any slope that's greater, the th greater than three to one or any sloped land near a sensitive feature, a stream, a wetland, skinny atlas lake, erosion control is very prudent and you should do everything you can to make sure that you are preventing erosion and always speak to the, the proper officials in town to make sure that you're doing everything by the book because different areas have different regulations. Okay, so we've seeded a meadow and the meadow demonstration photos that you just saw of seeding at Go Natives were a little over a month ago. And this is what it looks like earlier this week. Um, about one month after seeding, we see a lot of vegetation coming up. The grasses are a companion crop that we used. We used a grain oat and the companion crop helps the meadow establish because it'll hold the soil It'll help obscure the little seeds that are slow to germinate from predators. It'll protect the slower growing seedlings from extreme heat and sunlight. And generally it'll help uh, hold the whole meadow together. They will disappear in a year or two. We'll just cut the seed heads off and that's it. Let's zoom in a bit. So of course we see all the grasses and then we also see some of the early germinating species. We see lots of this, um, complex leaf here, that's partridge pea, an annual legume that'll seed itself in year after year. All of these little leaves, um, almost all of them, I'll zoom in even further, there's our partridge pea and these fuzzy leaves here, that's black-eyed Susan, another species we use because it seeds very early, I mean uh, the seeds germinate very early, uh, provides early color, you all know what black-eyed black Susans look like, uh, and so they help with erosion, they provide early cover, they provide early food for beneficial insects. So always a big component of our seed mixes. Up here in the top right, we have one of the monardas that looks like monarda fistulosa, the bee balm that we saw earlier with the pink purple flowers and covered in bumblebees. So the seed germination rate is also quite dynamic in these meadows. Um, some of the species we use require cold stratification, which means they won't germinate until they've gone through a winter in the ground, you know, at least three months of cold and wet. So many species in a seed mix you won't see until at least the second year, sometimes the third. In the example of this seed mix, we won't see any of the mountain mints, the pycnanthemums, until the next year. We won't see any of the, the tradescantias, the spider warts, until the next year. And that's why it's critical to tailor a seed mix to a particular site. Let's say you have a very slopey site. I would make a special seed mix to make sure that enough seeds germinate per area to prevent erosion. And yet those seeds don't outcompete the slower growing species that we prefer to dominate as the meadow matures. So there's nuance to every decision. I'll show you another quick example of my backyard. This is my house in Jamesville when I moved in. It was a mess, don't even get started on the house, uh, but we'll just focus on the meadow. This is what I was working with, and this is what it looks like now. Um, notice my meadow, my personal meadow, which is just 2,000 square feet, looks a lot different from the examples I showed you. I install so many very showy meadows for clients that um, I've become kind of a snob, and I wanted my own meadow to be very, very subdued and focus more on the greens and the textures and only a few colors of flowers, yellow, purple, and white. Um, that's just my taste. I'm a snob like that. Uh, here's what it looked like last year in late summer with Canada wild rye, those drooping seed heads. And zooming in, of course, there's color. It's just more subtle. We have on the left, the white flowers are Pensamen digitalis, which we saw earlier. And similarly, we saw the um, purple flowers of the spiderwort. There's many species that I put in the seed mix that show up, like this Monarda punctata, dotted mint. But in anyone's meadow, there will always be what we call volunteer species that show up on their own, like this wonderful native bone set, Eupatorium perfoliatum, a beautiful plant 
incredibly high beneficial insect value and it showed up on its own. Now I often put this plant in seed mixes, but if I were to help someone craft a seed mix for their property, first I would take a quick look around and see what plants are there so I get to an idea of what might be in the seed bank already. Then you'll get non-native species that show up on their own. This is common mullein. And look, I've mentioned the word exotic a few times. Just because a species of plant or animal is exotic doesn't mean it's bad. There's very few examples of exotic species that are measurably harmful, and those are very harmful, but most of them are, are innocuous. Now, in some settings, a mullein might be a problematic weed, but in my meadow, I love it. The reason for that is I've worked with researchers at the Smithsonian in Virginia, and we have found that mullein is one of the most important foods for bumblebees when it's flowering this time of year. It's also, look at it, it's a, it's a much more robust plant than all of those thin stemmed grasses and flowers in the background. So in uh, late summer, fall, when the seeds are maturing, it will be covered in goldfinches, perching all over it, eating the seeds. It's also a perch for small birds of prey like kestrels. So for me, it's an interesting structural element. Very importantly, these meadows are not plant communities that you, you sow the seed and you walk away and it's hands off. We want people to get engaged with them, to add plants to them, to manage them the way they want. And what I do with most landowners is I help them create a seed mix as if it is the first layer on a painting. It's your base. And then once they start learning about these plant communities, they can begin adding highlights. Let's say at the entry of a trail through the meadow, let's say at a high point um, that they want a splash of a particular color. And then we start adding plants and you can get plugs, which are small containerized plants or larger plants and pots at lots of places, you know, like Go Natives has a lot of plants. So we hope that people who have these meadows will get plants there or elsewhere and, and start planting them in their meadows. Um, and these are just a few examples of my backyard meadow. Um, I had a wetter area, so I added the mist flower at the left there. I had an area under a tree, which was shady, so I added this blue stem goldenrod in the center. And another wet area elsewhere, and the far right, I put in some obedient plant. It's just a way to get more engaged with your meadow as a plant community. And I'll just add quickly, especially for kids, these are tremendous plant communities to teach people about ecology. A forest is overwhelming, but even for a child, you can look over the, the canopy of a meadow and understand the interactions of all these plants. So to be clear, we, these are not like hands-off national park habitats. They are a balance between important habitat that protects lake health and a garden. And we want any landowner to be engaged with their meadow and to, to have ownership over it. Very quickly on maintaining a meadow. Um, yes, they're less work than mowing a lawn, but they do require some maintenance. And the reason for that is in this part of the world, trees move in and eventually woody vegetation will uh, succeed and the meadow will become a forest. Now, traditionally, uh, meadows are managed with fire. There's me, I'm a prescribed fire manager. Um, probably not feasible for any of you. Uh, so this is a, a technique that native peoples have used for thousands of years um, that, you know, us brilliant scientists are kind of acting like we discovered it recently, which is absurd. Uh, and these plant communities are adapted to fire, but again, not appropriate for most of your situations. Similarly inappropriate, these systems are also adapted to large grazers that preferentially eat certain plants and shift distributions of species. Um, probably not appropriate. And I'm happy to talk with any of you who raise cattle because these plants are tremendously useful as cattle fodder in the right situation. But for most of you, cutting is probably the key for managing a meadow. And cutting is really just to make sure uh, woody vegetation doesn't start to take over. And Cutting is very light. It's not like mowing aggressively like we do with our lawns. Um, in the first year, you might cut a meadow maybe two to five times, depending on what plants come up. And it's a very high cut. Depending on the size of your meadow, it could be done with a weed whacker or a bush hog on a mower. And that's a high cut around 10 inches. You really just want to cut the seed heads off of any annual weeds that show up and, and get light to the slower growing seedlings that uh, take a while to get started. And for many sites, especially the typical property size in Skinny Atlas, 
hand weeding is pretty sufficient for managing a meadow the first year and long term. You'll see yard species like this white clover invading on the edges, and you can pull that depending on the scale. You'll see, uh, I, I put weeds in quotations because weeds is so subjective. It's just a plant out of place. Uh, in the center there, we see a seedling of staghorn sumac, a beautiful native shrub that I absolutely adore. Um, of course, they'll invade meadows. I have some coming up in my meadow and I just cut them every year or two and they come right back. Um, I just don't want them to get too big. So it's, it's building a relationship and learning about these, these habitat features. All right, I'll end with just some thoughts on the economics of creating a meadow and converting your lawn to meadow because I want to make sure there's time for questions with you all. And look, uh, I have that annoying habitat uh, habit, <laughs> excuse me, I have that annoying habit that all scientists have where I start every answer with the words, it depends. So the cost savings of converting your lawn to meadow really depend on many factors. And these are just a few. So how much do you spend on lawn care now? And the price and quantity you need of meadow seed to establish a meadow, um, your aesthetic goals, which may change the type of plants you want. Uh, flower seed, for example, of um, many species tends to be more expensive than grass seed. So how much flower dominance do you want versus grass dominance? And if you're on a sloped site, you would probably need much more seed per, per unit area than a flat site to prevent erosion and, and all these different factors. I pasted in this useful table that I, I took from a manual, and you can see the citation there, for, um, comparing conventional lawn to a seeded meadow in terms of cost. And please take this information with a grain of salt. This, these are data from two organizations, the Maryland State Highway Association and JD Towns and Landscapers, who are great people, I've worked with them before. But these are very narrow data sets. However, the general principle behind them is very informative. So one way to think of it is a, a meadow may seem like a large capital investment, but you make up that cost with lower long-term management inputs. Um, you know, also ignore that life expectancy chart. Meadows are essentially climax systems. If you keep the woody vegetation out of them, they will live forever. Um, these plants reseed themselves in and many of the plants like big blue stem, for example, can live well over a century, uh, very long lived things. So I thought this would be a bit helpful, but again, every, every person's situation is specific. And last very quickly example, um, meadow seed could seem expensive when you start looking at it online and yeah, it, it can be. But remember, less seed is used per area than we would do for a lawn or a crop. Whereas a lawn, you might need something like 100 to 150 pounds of seed per acre. For a meadow, you might need 5 to 20. Just a quick example. So back to our demonstration site at Go Natives. For this area, we needed one pound of seed. And that costs just about 38 bucks. That's it. And the management input for the first year, cutting it maybe two or four times. Uh, weeding it occasionally as needed long term. So compare that to a lawn already and you start to see the, the differences there. Well, anyway, that's my very quick run through of a meadow presentation. Um, I hope it's just enough to get you interested. There are so many caveats and subtleties here. So, you know, please contact me. But more importantly, please contact the Restoration Science Center and follow us on social media because this is just one taste of one of our programs. And um, we do so much more. And very importantly, uh, use these QR codes. I, I don't know about this stuff. I, I'm a meadow guy, not a, a computer guy. But you can scan them with your phone, and it takes you to our web pages. And also, we are going to do a, a field visit demonstration uh, toward the end of summer that we are organizing now. And if you'd like to be part of that, this is your opportunity to sign up and talk to us about it and see if you'd like to join us for that to learn about these things in the field and, and see some of these plants in person. So please uh, sign up for all of our social media so you know what we're up to. Meadows are just one thing. We work on every habitat in various places around the world, not just locally. So there's something for everyone. And um, my last thing to say is, if any of you are interested in talking about meadows with me, I'm, I'm not charging fee for service, just so that's clear. I'm not going to come out and then ask for money. Um, the Restoration Science Center is support, supported primarily through charitable donation. So um, 
just wanted that out in the open. I'm not going to show up and then uh, surprise you with a bill. Okay. <laughs> and um, some of my colleagues from this, this center may have more information during our question and answer period for any of you who are interested. And with that, I don't want to run out of time. So I'm going to stop my timer. Thank you. I hope you're all still there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. That was great. Um, I'm going to start with some of the questions that came in before. If you um, don't mind, I'll leave this up just so people can see it. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, so the first question um, that a couple people asked actually was, how do you control or manage um, native species or even non-native and invasive species that might take over? Um, one homeowner specifically mentioned the highway department and their mowing can kind of spread invasives along the edge of properties and that can be difficult to kind of control them. So just talking about managing and invasives are what you want in, in the meadow. Yeah, that's a really difficult topic too. It's like, yeah, you can do everything you want for your own land, but your neighbor's land contributes to it. Um, yes, managing invasive, we call invasive plants that I'm quoting are particularly aggressive, not like a plant can be aggressive, but Native species can be invasive too. Um, Canada goldenrod is a good example of a very aggressive native plant that spreads through rhizomes and can outcompete other shorter plants that don't grow as vigorously. Um, numerous techniques to control invasive species once a meadow is established. Um, I talked mostly about clearing the site, but of course, once it's established, your techniques change. In many situations, hand weeding is enough at larger scales, that becomes impossible unless you have a large labor force and tons of money, which a lot of people don't. Um, in those cases, targeted applications of herbicide are an option, and there's many products that are available for that. But again, it's not something that's for everyone or accessible to everyone. Um, targeted cuttings using a weed whacker are possible. Um, there are many techniques, but unfortunately, it so depends on the plant species and the site on what's most appropriate and, and also the surrounding meadow vegetation that I can't give a blanket answer, but there are many techniques available for that purpose. And I feel your pain with the highway department. They mowed all my staghorn sumac on the side of the road that I purposely planted because they thought it was a weed and they were doing me a favor. So there you go. Great. Um, let's see, another question that we had was um, advice for native um, water loving erosion resistant plants. Um, this person lives next to one of the tributaries um, to Skinny Atlas Lake and they have textbook uh, streamside erosion. So can you kind of talk about how meadows might help with, um, with erosion? Yeah, so ideally if you have a stream that stream will be bordered by woody vegetation like trees and shrubs. Um, that is definitely better than a, a meadow, which is an open plant community. But if you're in a situation where you might want to rely on uh, herbaceous vegetation for stream protection, there's lots of species you can, you can use. Um, many of the rushes, uh, the juncus genus, are appropriate for that application. Many of the uh, perennial ryes like Virginia wild rye or Canada wild rye are appropriate for that application. Now, establishing them can be tricky. Um, if there's a lot of erosion, it could be tough to do that using seed. So you might have to time that application with a, a droughty period or use um, uh, like a, I don't know, like plugs, for example. You could hydro seed, which is a technique I didn't talk about. It involves uh, putting the seeds in a slurry and it sticks to the soil. Um, it's, it's a tricky subject. It's, I can talk more about that person's specific situation with them elsewhere, but yeah, there's lots of meadow type species that could be used for that purpose. But again, woody vegetation is always superior for buffering a stream. Great. Um, before I ask the next question, I'll just say that I'm going to share contact info for Sam and, and anything else that Sam would like me to share as well as the recording and a follow-up email. So you guys will have cool. all that information for more of the specific questions. <laughs> Um, another question was how to deal with difficulties in finding some of these native plant species that you'd want to use in a meadow at nurseries or just locally um, difficulties sure. finding them. Yeah, so um, there are, uh, there's two sources, there's seed and then there's uh, growing plants, right? So uh, there's many seed companies that do this professionally that have a huge and diverse inventory. Um, uh, so Ernst Conservation Seed is the one I've worked with the most and they donated the seed for this project. There's also Roundstone Seed, Prairie Moon, Prairie Nursery, 
Pinelands. Um, and seed is, is one avenue. But for many of you, if you have a very, very small area or you want to add plants to a meadow, you might want to just buy separate containerized plants. And there's lots of sources for that. Locally, you have people like Grow Natives, where our demonstration sites are. And um, there's, you know, there's other companies that are within the area. You know, I can talk, point out a few. Let's see, Skinny Atlas area. There's um, uh, the Plantsman. Um, closer to me in Jamesville here, we have Maple Hill Nursery. There's lots of sources that have native plants. Um, you know, Amanda's Garden for more of the like woodland ephemerals. And then of course you can order them online. Many of the same seed companies that produce seed also sell containerized plants uh, in small sizes. Um, so I'd, I would encourage you to start local because those plants are likely most adapted to your local growing conditions, even though you know all native species may be native, but certain plants grown locally are more likely more appropriate for that specific ecology. It's the right um, ecotype, as we call it. So start local and um, you know, happy to go from there. Maybe there's even people that are on this presentation that have nurseries or nursery connections that can talk to you in the chat or connect with you elsewhere. Great. Um, one question is, can meadows be planted on a septic mound? <laughs> sure. Yep. <laughs> Easy <Nice>. answer. <laughs> yep. And um, so, yeah, I've designed custom mixes for that. Um, it, well, it depends on the, the septic mound. Um, I've helped some folks with that in the last couple of years, and every situation is different. And then there's companies that make custom mixes for that, but I would be careful. Some of them I've looked at, and I'm like, I would never do that. So, um, yes, it's absolutely possible, but it's, it's slightly trickier. Depends on your system. Gotcha. Um... Another person was talking about different ordinances and uh, yeah. kind of zoning for, you know, <laughs> not having plants above 10 inches or, you know, lawn above 10 inches. So how do you kind of work within um, regulations and ordinances in, in planning and establishing meadows? Yes, this is a great question that um, I was hoping would come up. So in a lot of a lot of townships or, or whatever, you have certain restrictions on, uh, like Camille was saying, a height of vegetation, for example. Um, there are ways to work with that. Um, for First off, many of those regulations are specific. So it might be vegetation can be no more than this height when this distance from a building, for example. Um, in other situations, I encourage people to, to treat meadows as true landscape installations, as meadow gardens. So it's an intentional planting. It's not a mess. So putting a clean line around it. Um, uh, I don't know, trying to keep it tidy. So for example, um, in fall when the plants go dormant and they all flop over into the yard, well then, you know, just mow those so it's nice and neat. Um, I would look up your specific ordinances. Uh, you know, we've done work in Skinny Atlas and I, I and some colleagues of mine tried exhaustively to find ordinances that would restrict the types of plantings that uh, the folks we were working with wanted and we couldn't find anything that said it would be prohibited. But those are in particular settings. So um, I, I think it's a matter of talking to folks in the city and uh, you know, uh, respecting what they have to say, but, but also taking with a grain of salt that some of the specifics may not apply to a meadow. I'll just quickly add to uh, people are often worried that establishing a meadow on their land might increase like the mice in their house or ticks or snakes. And that simply isn't true. Uh, I've been studying these things for years and others that have will tell you the same thing. Um, ticks do not increase. Uh, at least the deer ticks that give us Lyme disease. Um, and I've not found increases in other ticks as well. Um, mice don't increase. Mice can live anywhere. They can live in your walls. They don't need a meadow. Other mammals will increase like voles and shrews that don't wander into our homes as much. Uh, and snakes need the sun themselves. They'd only be in a meadow to eat the little rodents. And we don't have that many venomous snakes around here. So it's not a big problem. <laughs> Great. So we're a little over time, but I do want to ask one more question. Also, I'm sorry if you can hear all the construction noise. They're doing construction <laughs> on my street in the city of Syracuse. Yep. Um, so I'm going to ask one other question that I think is a good um, one to kind of end on and kind of a broad question. Um, what time frame during the year is it ideal to sow a meadow? Oh, great question. So um, you've got Central New York is a lot more forgiving than certain parts of the world. Uh, usually meadows are seeded in spring or fall. Uh, and spring, this part of the world, um, you're talking like, you know, maybe mid-May through late June. 
fall would be uh, maybe like late September through mid October. You just don't want uh, the snowy season to start. Each technique has its advantages and there's lots of caveats to how you choose one or the other. Um, you know, basically it depends on the status of the vegetation clearing, the type of seed you're using, the slope of your site, all, all these other factors. Uh, but Central New York is really forgiving with that sort of thing uh, compared to some of the places I've worked where it's a narrow window. So if you're thinking about doing it, um, you know, it's, if you have to clear vegetation, you're not gonna have time to do a fall seeding, but maybe a spring seeding, this is the time to start planning. Uh, and come to our demo workshop so you can get a feel of these things in person and uh, start picking out the plants you like. By the way, I'm, I'm happy to stick around if that's okay with Camille, if people have more questions, but Camille's running the show. Oh yeah, I just didn't want to keep you if you had something else, but um, yeah, why don't we go through, because there's only a couple other um, sure, yeah. questions that I see. Um, one is from Frank from uh, the League Association. I know um, that guy. <laughs> Beyond cutting, what other strategies can you recommend for reducing rabbit and deer brows? Um, he's asking, he's heard mm -hmm. of uh, professionals using a recipe for hot pepper wax spray. Could that be something to explore? Have you heard of that? Uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, I focus on working landscapes uh, and under the private lands initiative. So I mostly work with farmers and I've heard everything in the book. And man, when someone comes up with something that keeps deer off of a plant, um, uh, I'd love to hear about it. So in deer heavy areas, this is part of a site assessment. We tend to focus on plants that are deer proof, like mints. Deer are not gonna eat mints um, and deer won't eat most grasses. But yeah, on a very small site, if you get some troublesome deer, they can decimate the seedlings. Um, rabbits similar, uh, but usually I, I've seen very few of these problems because we tend to focus on plant species that we know are more deer resistant deer would probably want to eat your beautiful landscape shrubs than they would most of these meadow plants. Um, as, as you all know, unfortunately, uh, deer are overpopulated in much of the east and they're one of the biggest ecological problems that we have. And unfortunately for the deer, almost every deer that isn't shot or hit by a car ends up starving to death because they run out of food. So it's, it's a tough situation. The real answer to that question is we need to get more serious about what we do about the deer. And, you know, that that is a difficult question to answer uh, because the techniques are uh, are sometimes difficult to swallow if <laughs> if you follow me. Yeah, I know the city of Syracuse has definitely been dealing with that lately um, <laughs> yeah. in terms of deer management. Um, another question is what is the minimum size for establishing a meadow? Yeah, so th there's really no minimum size. The question is what is the size that's large enough at which you should consider seed? So remember the image that I showed you of our demo site at Go Natives? That is, geez, like a 30 foot by 50 foot site. So, you know, maybe 1500 feet square. Um, at that scale, I mean, I would say over about, you know, maybe 500 square feet, it is cost prohibitive to plant plugs directly. Now, of course you get faster growth the first few years and all that, because they're already uh, established plants, but, if, if you think about it, our demo site, it was like less than $40 worth of seed. You can buy maybe 10 good plants for that, uh, which would give you like, I don't know, like 10 square feet of planting, maybe. So um, it's really more about maximum size. Uh, you can do a square, meter, a square meter meadow by planting, you know, like seven or eight plugs in a small area. Um, as long as they'll persist with the surrounding vegetation, you'll have to weed them. But um, no, it's, there's no minimum size. It's really about, okay, what's your objective? If you wanna help water quality, the bigger, the better, right? Um, if you wanna support grassland birds, like grasshopper sparrow, for example, you need at least 50 acres. So look at what you have in your available space. And then people like us at the Restoration Science Center can help you identify the greatest good you can do with what you're working with. And for most of you, um, I expect you have relatively small acreages. You will be uh, you will be best served by protecting water quality and promoting beneficial insects like butterflies and bees, and that provides food for songbirds that have relatively small habitat requirements compared to these grassland birds that need tens of acres. Um, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, definitely. Um, someone asked. 
What grasses do you recommend? And don't say it depends. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, my go-to grass is little blue stem, beautiful grass. Um, I shy away from the taller grasses that are more tall grass prairie species like big blue stem, um, depending on the variety, switchgrass, Indian grass. In small amounts, something like Indian grass in a meadow, a short meadow will be wonderful. Um, but generally I like shorter grasses because most landowners I work with prefer to have a meadow they can look over that isn't at head height. So short grasses would include little blue stem, side oats grandma, um, broom sedge, which is considered a noxious weed in agriculture, but is a beautiful meadow plant. So, you know, maybe don't plant it if you're friends with the farmer next door and you don't want to bother them. Um, cool season native grasses too, like the rye, perennial rye, Canada wild rye, Virginia wild rye. Um, there's even in wetter areas, I like sedges. Uh, fox sedge is a great species to use in wetter areas. It's Carex vulpinoidea. Uh, other sedges like Carex squarosa. I don't know the common names of a lot of species, so I'm not trying to show off with the Latin. It's just easier to remember for me. Um, tons and tons of species. I strongly recommend treat this like you're shopping for furniture. I'm serious, like go to someplace like Ernst Conservation Seed or round stone and they have catalogs and you can literally look at pictures of each plant and they have their like statistics like height range and all that their growing conditions moisture requirements and all that and make a list be like oh i like that one i like that one and then you start to refine that list by saying oh well that plant needs a very wet soil and this plant needs very dry soil and my site's like very wet so i shouldn't use the dry one that's going to fail and then you start to learn about ecology so uh i that's better than saying it depends right yeah, definitely. I think those are great examples. Um, and then one last question. This is actually going back to kind of earlier in your presentation when you had that slide showing um, how dense the root systems can be of these plants. Yeah. Um, this person is asking, what was the low growing plant at the end on the right? She said above ground it was short, but below ground it had substantial roots. I will have, let's check together. Here. Sounds good. Okay. Oops. I, I might have to share my screen again. Uh, oh, okay, cool. Here, I'll, I would like to show this to you, all of you, so check it out. The plant on the right is buffalo grass. This, really interesting because buffalo grass functionally is almost identical to Bermuda grass. Do we all know that invasive weed? You know, great for horse forage, right? But really bad weed that are, is tough to get rid of. Buffalo grass is a native turf grass. It's a warm season grass, which means it does its growing in the very hot time of summer. So it'll be nice and green when it's a drought condition in July and August, not like right now, but sometimes. Uh, and uh, for a lot of people who are doing things like, um, let's say trying to manage a, a small golf course that's more ecologic, ecologically uh, uh, beneficial, why not instead of using Bermuda grass, if you're in an appropriate area, use buffalo grass because it is a native, it's not as aggressive as Bermuda grass, and it has many more wildlife associations like with caterpillars and insects than Bermuda grass, an exotic species does. So there you go. Buffalo grass. Uh, there's there's a native grass or flower for every situation. They're not all bunch grasses. Some of them are turf species. Nice. Glad someone brought that up. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Sam. I think those are all the questions that I saw. Um, Great. So I just want to say thank you, Sam, <laughs> and thank you for everyone who stuck around a little bit longer. Um, I'm going to send out a follow up email in the next couple of days with a link to the recording. Um, contact information for Sam so you can get in touch with him and ask maybe some of your more specific questions. Um, and yeah, otherwise, thank you so much, Sam. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Yeah, uh, I, I'm seeing some questions about how do we contact you, but hopefully that Camille's, Camille answered your questions. So yeah, please contact us, sign up for RSC social media, you'll, you'll get us. Yeah, I'll share all the stuff for the RSC too, so you guys can have that as well. Great. And special prize to anyone who counts how many times I said meadow in this presentation after you watch the recording. <laughs> great. Well, thank you, everyone. And thanks, Sam. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>